Today's event is focused on understanding dynamic motion using angular rate sensors, where you will learn more about angular velocity measurements for a variety of applications. Before we get started, I'd like to cover the format and a few logistics. The webinar will be a slide presentation and audio and video from the presenter only. Uh, all attendees are muted, but please make sure to check that the slides are visible and that you can hear the presenter. We encourage you to submit questions throughout the presentation by typing them in the Q&A window. You should see the button at the bottom uh, of your screen. We'll have a panel of experts monitoring and answering questions throughout the webinar. We'll also scan the questions at the conclusion and answer as many as we can, time permitting. We'll then compile all of the Q&A to send out to everyone as a follow-up after the event. Uh, this session will be recorded and made available to you uh, at a later date. Uh, so you can share with your colleagues if there's a specific topic uh, afterwards that you would like to cover directly in a private meeting, please reach out to us and coordinate with your sales team. Uh, we're very interested in learning more about and helping you solve your particular application. Your presenter today is Mike Beckage. Uh, we also have uh, a couple of our, our folks on, uh, on the panel to answer Q&A in the background. Uh, Chad Ivan is out of our Michigan office. He's our applications manager focused on automotive applications. And uh, Kate Martin leads our technical support team in, in Europe. Uh, Mike is our CTO and uh, co-founder. He leads our support team globally, and we're happy to have him share his presentation today with the group. So with that, I will turn it over to Mike. Well, thanks a lot, Jim, and uh, welcome everyone. Good morning, afternoon, and or evening, depending on where you are in the world. And I am really excited to share about angular rate sensors and how they work, their applications, and our products. Thank you again for attending. And uh, I find it very exciting. I've actually spent a large part of my life's work in developing angular rate sensor technology for the, uh, for the testing world. And uh, so it's very important to me and I, I really um, have enjoyed being a part of developing these products. So the first thing I'm gonna do, we're gonna try something new here today. We're gonna take a quick poll. And I have a single question. Are you primary, how are you primarily using angular rate sensors and this is a live poll that i just launched and so uh, please feel free to vote so the categories are automotive that could be crash testing or product development biomechanics um, aerospace that could be flight test product test engine test general product testing sports bicycles skis sporting equipment helmets you name it and finally, the last category is if you're not using ARS at all in any way, shape, or form, I'd like to know that as well. So this is exciting. I can see um, the, poll, the poll numbers are coming in, and so far, it looks like biomechanics research is winning, <laughs> followed closely by automotive and aerospace, and uh, not a particularly distant fourth place. Uh, looks like product testing. Great. All right, as the num numbers tally up here, I can see we've got uh, close to 70 responses and we're coming in at roughly one-fourth automotive, one-fourth biomechanics, and one-fourth aerospace. So that's very interesting. Well, thank you so much for voting. I really appreciate that. Um, well, hopefully the information that I uh, cover today will be applicable to all of your applications. And if you're not currently using ARS, uh, perhaps you will consider using them in the future. Thank you very much. Okay, let's get on with um, the topic list. So number one, we're gonna cover the basics of understanding dynamic motion. Technology has certainly evolved in this area with uh, going from purely mechanical systems to micro electromechanicals uh, ARS systems 
we'll talk about key features, setting up a DAS system to work with ARS, and then common applications for the ARS, and finally choosing the correct device. So first of all, let's talk about the basics of dynamic motion. There are three directions that we talk about when we're making measurements. We often talk of these as the X, Y, and Z, or the longitudinal, lateral, and vertical axes. It's easy to imagine if we think about a vehicle driving around a track or on the road. The longitudinal axis is the forward direction, the lateral is the side to side, and the vertical is up and down. But in addition to the linear directions of X, Y, and Z, there are also rotational motions about those axes. So we normally think of rotation about the longitudinal axis as roll, rotation about the vertical axis as yaw or turning, and lateral rotation about the lateral axis as pitch. Together, we refer to these as six degrees of freedom. If we understand linear motion plus angular motion, we have a complete picture of dynamic motion. If you're working with test dummies or biomechanics applications, the same type of coordinate system applies to a human body or a test dummy or an anthropomorphic test device. And here we can see this is actually the SAEJ211 standard for defining those six degrees of freedom to a human being. So let's talk about what we get from an angular rate sensor. An angular rate sensor actually measures the rate of rotation, not the angle, but rather the rate of turning. The standard units of measure are degrees per second. How many degrees of rotation do we turn per second? And that can be thought of also as RPM. If you've used a tachometer or take RPM measurements, it's, it's pretty much the same thing. If you take an angular rate sensor and simply divide the output by six, it's a direct conversion to RPM. So for example, the 18,000 degree per second ARS divided by six can measure up to 3,000 RPM. This is sometimes missed by our users. If you need a tachometer, you can use an ARS. And if you need to have the units in radians per second, you simply divide the number by the conversion to radians. If we take the angular rate data and we zero it and filter it, and then perform a simple numerical integration, we can calculate the angle change over time. This is often used in applications where we need to determine perhaps the angle of one part of a system versus another dynamically, often used with crash test dummies for things like rear impact testing and seat testing. Now it's important to note that the angle change calculation only works with a sensor that has DC response or response all the way down to zero hertz. And then finally, if we take the derivative of or differentiate the angular rate data, we can calculate angular acceleration. So in this case here, the acceleration, the angular rate data that I'm showing at the top of the screen, when we differentiate it, we actually get the angular acceleration. This is the same data just processed a little differently. Filtering is very important and normally we filter the data, the, the raw angular rate data between 300 and 1000 hertz to get the best results. Now, uh, tech, the technology has evolved. Uh, the idea of measuring the angle or the rate something is moving goes way back to using old fashioned rotating gyros. And in this case, we have a spinning mass suspended in what we call gimbals. And when we, when we spin those gim, uh, when we spin that rotor, it actually uh, wants to maintain its orientation no matter what orientation the gimbal's in. And so an example of a real world old fashioned gyro is this large mechanical system that was very likely used in uh, aircraft guidance. And you can see on the left, 
there's a gimbal mounted rotor and on the right the gimbal mounted rotor is spinning very fast so that it has rotational inertia that way when we change the mounting the black box it's mounted in its orientation the gyro stays in the same position from about the 1940s until the 1980s if you wanted an angular rate sensor they were typically typically called rate gyroscopes and they were very large very power hungry and they were mechanical systems which meant that they wore out over time in the 19 late 1980s and 1990s solid state gyros became popular and those those devices were much smaller and lower power and they started replacing rotating mechanical gyros in the year 2008 dts introduced our first angular rate sensor and this device is obviously much smaller uh, than any of the mechanical gyros it's roughly three or four percent the size of the previous generation of solid state gyros draws very little power and only weighs two grams so this is an important evolution if we wanted to make a six degree of freedom measurement when i first started doing dynamic testing in the late 1970s and 1980s we would typically use three large linear accelerometers and three solid state gyros for a total volume of maybe 130 cubic centimeters however in uh, just a few years ago dts came out with a very small six degree of freedom measurement cube that's 25 times smaller and much lower power and we called that the 60x pro so the evolution from big mechanical gyros to solid state uh, technology has really made a big difference in our ability to measure things. So how does an ARS work? Well, first of all, the ARS and the ARS Pro devices, as well as devices from other manufacturers, are what we refer to as MEMS devices. And MEMS simply stands for Microelectromechanical System. These devices have a sensing element, but they also have a number of other electronic features. We have built-in power regulation, amplifiers, and filters. So it's actually a very complicated device, given the fact that it fits into such a small package. Now, the principle hit on these devices is we use an, an oscillating element, a vibrating element that has inertia. When we excite that element to oscillate, and then we try to change its angle, there is a force created that is due to what we call the Coriolis effect. And the Cor Coriolis force is sensed and converted to millivolts of output per degree per second. So here we see an ARS Pro. We supply any voltage from 4.9 to roughly 15 volts. So typical five and 10 volt excitation. And when um, we excite that with the proper excitation, we get a nominal output of plus and minus two volts. So for example, the ARS 8K, 8,000 degrees per second full scale, puts out about 0.2 millivolts per degree per second. So what is the Coriolis effect? Well, Gaspard Coriolis, who lived in the late 1700s and 1800s, realized that the concept of work and energy in a rotating reference frame had some spe special considerations and so what we learned is that that anything that's rotating or oscillating on an axis has momentum and wants to keep rotating in the same direction on the same axis changing the direction of the device will generate a reaction force that can be measured and this is essentially the coriolis effect if we look at it in terms of a vibrating tuning fork, if the tuning fork is oscillating in the direction shown by the blue arrows, and then we try to rotate the tuning fork, we will get a Coriolis force in the direction of the green arrows. 
which can actually be measured by looking at the forces at the base of the tuning fork. This is the fundamental principle that all angular uh, rate sensors work on. Now, we're not using tuning forks, we're using micro electromechanical systems. And so this is a close up image, an, an actual uh, electron microscope image of the silicon structure inside of an angular rate sensor. You can't really see much, but it's a tiny structure, perhaps uh, one to two millimeters across. And it's essentially a very tiny, accurate tuning fork. Interesting side note that the Coriolis effect is what causes hurricanes to spin in one direction in the Northern hemisphere on the earth and the Southern hemisphere in the South. Uh, so, if you want to know more about the Cor Coriolis effect, it's a very fascinating effect and you can look it up. Our original ARS models were introduced between uh, 2007 and 2008. And one of the main reasons that we introduced that product is because the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration in the US was in the process of publishing an update to the rear impact testing standard for automobiles. Up until this time, sensing the motion of the head with respect to the upper body was done with video analysis. But as NHTSA became aware that these sensing technologies were becoming more available, they, they said, okay, an alternate method is to put an angular rate sensor in the head and an angular rate sensor in the chest. And then if you integrate the data from those two, you can actually tell how far the neck moves in a rear impact. Uh, NHTSA actually evaluated angular rate sensor technologies and gave us a very favorable report when they uh, assessed our technology way back then. Shock and vibration are just a normal part of dynamic testing. As a matter of fact, creating a shock pulse might in fact be the whole goal of the test. And so an angular rate sensor needs to properly quantify angular rate and perhaps position, position or acceleration. And it has to do that in a shock and vibration environment. And so what DTS did was we used a vertical pendulum, which is basically um, a pendulum mounted vertically with a pivot point in the middle um, at the bottom. And then we would put an ARS on the end of the pendulum and then measure the angle directly with a potentiometer. And then we would compare the output integrated from the angular rate sensor to the angle measured directly with a potentiometer. So on the graph at right here, the blue trace is actually the acceleration which peaks at about 150 Gs with uh, roughly 40 Gs of superimposed vibration. And then the actual angle is shown in red and the green is the integral of the ARS. What we want is for those traces to directly overlay. And what this is showing is that in a shock and vibration environment with the ARS mounted on the end of a moving beam that we can accurately quantify the angle of that beam. So it's a very important test, and it speaks to the fact that um, an angular rate sensor has got to be shock and vibration tolerant in dynamic testing. Now, in the year 2011 and 2012 uh, and 13, we actually came out with what we now sell as ARS Pro. So why did we do that? Well, number one, we found that some very high shock and vibration exposures could distort the ARS output. And the examples I'm talking about here are things like doing anthropomorphic test device calibrations, such as neck bending on the neck pendulum, uh, head form impacts against very hard surfaces or glass. And then there are certainly some military blast protection applications. In short, any application where the acceleration during the dynamic test might be over 150 Gs or so um, is, is where we needed to make improvements. One very important development that we worked on 
for several years was a project to actually put six degree of freedom recorders into army helmets. And the device shown on the left is what we refer to as a headborne energy analysis and di diagnostic system. It had three, a three axis accelerometer, a three axis angular rate sensor, and an air pressure sensor. Now, the technology that we developed to support this program actually wound up as the ARS Pro and a standard product. So this project was driven by the need to make accurate angle measurements in a very high shock and vibration environment. So what do we get from the ARS Pro? Well, number one, we're taking advantage of the latest MEMS technology. We significantly improved the range of linear accelerations over which the angular rate data maintains fidelity. We added a shunt test capability, which in my view is extremely important for ensuring that you're running a test and without um, a sensor or cable malfunction. And we reduced power consumption and noise. We first delivered the ARS Pro in 2011 and all ranges since 2013 have been of the ARS Pro second generation technology. So what are the key features of these angular rate sensors? Uh, number one, we have, a, we have the highest measurement range you're gonna find anywhere, all the way from 300 to 50,000 degrees per second. And, and even beyond that, all of the sensors typically have a little bit of headroom, so they'll go beyond a little bit beyond their rated output. DC response, all, of, uh, all these products work with slow changing positions. You can integrate the output to get very accurate angle measurements. They have stable output with different excitation voltages. So no matter what voltage you apply between 4.9 and 14 volts, you will get exactly the same output sensitivity. And based on my, my uh, comparative testing, I can tell you that some competitive ARS fail this test. The bandwidth is rated from 300 to 2000 Hertz. These bandwidths meet the SAE and ISO recommendations for biomechanics and crash testing and so on. Other key features, accurate and high G environment. The ARS Pro is the most shock tolerant and vibration tolerant ARS product on the market. And it meets and it's a requirement for use in test dummies. It's accurate in a high vibration environment. So you may not think about the fact that um, an automotive crash test or a dummy head actually vibrates at some very high frequencies, but it does. And our sensors are tested to maintain fidelity in those environments. We have an ISO 17025 uh, accredited calibration process. We couldn't buy the proper calibration equipment, so we developed our own, and we have those located around the world at our support offices. And all of the ARIS Pro models have shunt tech check capability. This is very important. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the other products out there don't have this capability. What we did, uh, what I did in order to make that possible was I made the ARS electrical circuit look like a standard Wheatstone bridge to a data recorder. And so this is important because it gives you the ability to cross check functionality before you run a test. So how do you connect uh, an ARS to a data recorder? The picture you see here is actually what's just under the, what, what's behind the sensor connector in a slice system. We have uh, a set, an excitation source of five volts and we have an amplifier. And there's really nothing more complicated than that in hooking it to the data recorder. We've got two connections for excitation. We have two connections for signal. And that uh, ARS should work with any data, data acquisition system from just about any manufacturer. Um, it can also be used as a, as a three-wire device if you've got uh, something like a single-ended input. How do you set the, the, the DAS up? Well, number one, we treat the ARS as a full bridge. It can work on five to 14 volts excitation. The output is not proportional to excitation, so it's internally regulated. So we wanna make sure we set the DAS software appropriately. And then if you're gonna do a shunt test, which I strongly recommend, you use an equivalent rest uh, resistance of three kilo ohms. It's important to note that all of our systems support uh, electronic ID and we deliver ARS pros with electronic ID. 
uh, to make it easy. Looking at the sensor setup data, here's some uh, typical sensor setup data for a, uh, an ARS Pro 8K when used on a, on a slice system. The key things here are you need to enter the sensitivity, the fact that it's not proportional to excitation. Five volts excitation always works. It's set, set up as a full bridge. We're gonna do a shunt test with an equivalent resistance of 3000 ohms. And um, that's it. It's very simple and straightforward. Let's talk a little bit about noise and frequency response. Um, first of all, with an ARS, it is a very different type of transducer than uh, we use in terms of things like strain gauge load cells and accelerometers, which are passive bridges. The angular rate sensor is a very active device and it uses an oscillating element in order to create the, uh, a situation where the Coriolis effect works. So the uh, element itself oscillates on purpose at a high frequency and some residual noise from that oscillation is normal. So if we look at the graph here, this is actually an angular rate sensor, uh, eight, uh, ARS 8K <clears throat> with a 2000 Hertz bandwidth. And you can see there's some noise on the signal. That is absolutely normal and um, normally isn't uh, any kind of issue at all other than to make you aware of it. You can reduce the apparent noise with filtering. Remember that the highest physical response in these types of sensors is typically 2000 Hertz. Most of the noise energy is greater than 10,000 Hertz. So if you filter at 2000 Hertz or below as needed, you will reduce the apparent noise. And in fact, you should always filter ARS data, no matter what system you use. Let's talk about some common applications. Well, of course, crash safety is, if not the top, at near the top of the applications. Product development. Anything that involves rotating <clears throat> machinery, of course, is a good candidate for using angular rate sensor technology. I'm very proud to say that we're working with most of the companies who are developing uh, human rated space capsules and um, angular rates of angular motion change are very important when you're talking about putting people inside of a spacecraft. Flight testing. Again, rotary rotating machinery like uh, helicopter rotors or parts of the aircraft control surfaces, a lot of flutter testing and things like that. Robotics. Robotics is a field that we've been working in for some number of years. Um, it's got a lot of moving parts and sometimes we want to quantify their motion and even wind energy. So again, rotating parts where we need to quantify their motion. A lot of sports applications in the news these days. Um, we've been working in the, in the realm of player to player impacts and helmet testing for a number of years. A number of bicycle manufacturers uh, are using our products for various types of testing and quantifying their dynamic motion, and even companies who are making skis have used our products on skis in field tests. Let's take a quick look at the products we offer uh, in this realm. We offer the ARS Pro, and uh, you'll notice on the on the upper image there, we also have what's called an HG model. The HG model is rated for very high shock and vibration in 50,000 degrees per second. And the lowest range we have is 300 degrees per second. All of these have DC response and you can integrate them to drive the angle of, of, of anything that's rotating. They all work on the same excitation voltages and have a two volt nominal output. We also package the same sensors into what we call the ARS3 Pro, which is a triaxial measurement cube. And then we combine the ARS3 Pro with three accelerometers, and we call that the 6DX Pro, a, a six degree of freedom cube. Another product we have is called the 6DX G2. And this was developed actually for systems that use our Slice 6 DAS system for in dummy installations. 
The 6DX G2 has 2000 G damped accelerometers, uh, 8000 or 18,000 degree per second angular rate sensors, and it's designed to couple directly to the data recorders for use in uh, around a, a test dummy or other places. We are developing a new model that's going to have lower G accelerometers for, um, in order to expand our ability to service other parts of the dynamic testing market. So let's talk about how you choose the correct model. Well, as I often say in my principles of dynamic data acquisition class, uh, you should start with whatever recommended practices apply to the type of work that you're doing. And so one place to look is SAJ211 and ISO International Standards Organization number 6487 recommended practices. And if you look at SAJ211, it actually specifically calls out angular rate sensors um, used in a test dummy. And this is important because the bandwidth we measure in the dynamic testing world often will affect the post-processing we do. So that's an important place to look. If you go to our website, and I put a link there that uh, you can see, dtsweb.com, and uh, data sheet for the angular rate sensor, you'll see we have a really nice application note section there, all the way from the ARS Pro 300 to the ARS HG 50K. You'll note that we also have um, list the different frequency responses and bandwidths available, a little bit of information about the noise, and um, then some guidance on where you should use or how you would pick those sensors for different testing environments. So again, this is on the back of the data sheet for the ARIS Pro product. Very helpful, I think. All right, let's talk a little bit about the DTS Help Center. So if you go to our website and you look on the right-hand side, there's a blue tab called Help Center. And when we click on that, it takes us to support at dtsweb.com. And at the Help Center, we have a lot of knowledge base items, uh, document downloads, and all sorts of things. If you want to find very specific information about the ARS, you can simply type ARS into the search box and it will come up with the list of documents that contain references to the angular rate sensor. So we have a lot of information there. You can see if you're a sales partner of DTS, you've got a specific area that gives you some comparative information about DTS and, and uh, competing products. We've got information on the natural frequency and noise, the data sheets for the different products, frequently asked questions. And if you're a registered user of the DTS Help Center, um, we can also grant you access to download the uh, specific step files and CAB models if you're looking to integrate the ARS into a product test design. So that concludes this portion of uh, the discussion. And um, I think what I'm going to do now is take a look at uh, the Q&A and also see if our panelists want to chime in with anything that they've learned from your questions. So I'm going to take, OK, so I'm going to pull one up here. Um, so a question comes up, do you run wires for the ARS through slip rings when needed? Or in other words, how do you get the signals from the rotating element to the stationary element when needed? That's a great question. Um, we certainly have customers who run the connections to the ARS through slip rings, but it's actually because we make such tiny data recorders, it's more common that uh, our users actually will place the data recorder onto the rotating device. So there's no need to go through slip rings. Um, we also have applications where the rotating device has an ethernet interface and, and we might take the communication lines uh, via ethernet through slip rings. 
I see another uh, another thought here about uh, a question about developing an angular accelerometer. And um, one of the things that we've been working on for some time is actually quantifying uh, head motion in sports. And uh, we actually ha we have to ha have a product as well as um, some new product development going on that is will be incorporating angular accelerometer technology. So I guess the answer there is stay tuned and uh, you know we're coming out with new products all the time and we'll have some angular accelerometer based devices out there before long. Another great question about uh, or a comment that initial orientations are critical and what are the best practices with ATDs. Um, that's a really good point. And when post-processing angular rate sensor data, it's really important to zero, filter, trim data sets to minimize effects of initial orientation, uh, I'll call it issues. So um, I don't know that I can say a lot more than that, but if you'd like to communicate with me directly about what you're thinking, uh, I'm always happy to hear from our users or potential users. Okay. Now here's a great question. Has anyone attached an ARS to a person under test versus a dummy? And the answer there is absolutely. Um, for many years, DTS was the number one company supporting the amusement industry with uh, testing high-speed thrill rides. And uh, we would affix angular rate sensors to uh, people, people's heads, wearing a headband and uh, basically take six degree of freedom measurements from a person's head while they're riding a roller coaster. That's our experience. I know that in biomechanics, they've definitely been used uh, in things like bite blocks. So literally putting angular rate sensors into a bite block that somebody would wear. I, I know this, uh, this, this is actually happens uh, in the military for some of their human rated testing. Uh, here's a great one. What pretest mechanical checks are performed? Uh, that may have been answered already, but I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Uh, obviously, we recommend periodic calibration on a rate table, but because of the DC response of the angular rate sensors, you can actually rotate the device through some known angle while you're collecting data and integrate it and make sure that you get the right angle. Okay, uh, another great question. Are there any trade-offs between using the ARS system versus the NAP? That's the nine accelerometer uh, arrays. And uh, there's been a fair amount of work done on this subject over the years. And um, some of the most recent work that I'm aware of uh, had to do with comparing the outputs of nine accelerometer arrays and then hybrid arrays of angular rate sensors and accelerometers. and um, I, I think from my perspective, the most accurate way to get angular, a, a full picture of the angular environment is to use a combination of, of uh, accelerometers with angular rate sensors taking a direct measurement of angular rate. So I have a lot more information on that. Uh, so if anybody wants uh, you know, some papers or uh, past information that kind of supports the different viewpoints on that subject, I'd be happy to happy to provide it. Okay, I'm going to ask our panelists who've been monitoring things here if uh, they've learned anything or would like to come on and uh, pick up the answer to any of the other questions. So Mike, there was a couple requests for maybe some white papers um, under the answered section. One of them was a white paper on the head path data, um, 14 CFR 25.562 aircraft seat testing. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, I'm not, um, but I don't think we have a white paper written yet specifically to that head path data. But I, there were two people actually that asked the same question. So I said we would look into it and 
<clears throat> it's a great idea. A absolutely. No, I, I, this is the kind of input we love is uh, tell us about your applications and we'll, and we'll address them. I appreciate that very much. Uh, FY, uh, just kind of as a general information thing, uh, DTS has actually been working with the Federal Aviation Administration for many years. And uh, I know that we've done a fair amount of work in some of the, um, at the impact lab in Oklahoma there. So we work collaboratively in that environment, but I'd love to know more about this application. There's one yeah. other question that just came in about uh, shock survivability. Yeah. Take that one. Sure. Yeah. So shock survive survivability. Um, the answer is uh, our, our shock survivability rating is actually very conservative. And uh, the question here was it's rated for 0.5 millisecond, 10,000 Gs. Will shorter pulses damage the ARS? And uh, this specific question is, has to do with metal to metal contact. Um, the, the answer is, it, it's a little difficult to quantify how, how bad pulses are above 10,000 Gs, but our shock rating is very conservative and a shorter pulse should not damage the part. Uh, they, these, these ARS have been extremely reliable. Uh, we have a very low failure rate, and uh, that includes all of the possible ways you can damage sensors like electrostatic discharge and mechanical impact. Um, I'll, I'll say they're uh, generally much more mechanically robust than the accelerometers you're used to working with. Okay, Mike, we're pretty close to our time limit here. Okay. Uh, great questions that, that, that came in. Again, we'll compile all of the mm -hmm. answers to the questions and share with, with everyone. So if we didn't get to yours live or if our panel didn't answer them, we will uh, turn those around pretty quickly here. Uh, there was also a question about whether or not the um, presentation will be available. And we will uh, post a video and uh, send that out in our, in our follow-up. So you'll be able to point people to the, the video or, or uh, review it as well afterwards. That, fantastic. Uh, let me answer one last quick question here about are we actively working on smaller technology? And uh, the answer is we're always, <laughs> we're always looking for a path to develop the next smallest, latest, greatest technology. And uh, we, we, have some, we have some projects in the work. Uh, in work, and uh, with any with any luck, uh, some of those some of those things will be coming to fruition, and probably in 2021. So I guess the answer there is stay tuned. Um, and I just want to thank everybody for attending the webinar. I, I can see we've had over 100 people signed on, and that's amazing. Uh, I wish you all well in this world that we're navigating and trying to stay safe in. And I'll give it back to Jim for any final comments. Okay. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. And uh, thank you all for attending. Again, we'll be in touch. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us directly if you have any additional questions. Uh, you, you have our um, email here. And uh, uh, just reach out directly, and we'll get you to the right person. And um, uh, again, appreciate it. And, have a great day. Thank you.